Right. All right. So this week we're talking about the minister who quit, Richard Hagenston. Um, the all all eight things that I that I've taken are from his his. Um, I guess it was it could be considered a blog or an article or whatever you want to say. Eight things your pastor will never tell you about the Bible. Um, he is the author of Fabricating Faith: How Christianity Became a Religion Jesus Would Have Rejected. Um, I believe the article I took it off of Patheos.com. I think that's where I got it from, uh, but I'm not positive, so don't quote me on that. So the first thing uh, he claims is, the, is that the apostles knew nothing of the virgin birth. That this was just something that was added later. Huh. Romans 1, 3-4. Regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, and through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. And so he, he takes this and says, you know, because of the date of the of when Romans was written, um, that the apostles seem to know, to know nothing of, of this virgin birth. Um, but for that, he doesn't really look at the whole story. Romans was written around 57 AD. Okay. Matthew and Mark were written around 55 AD. About. Possibly a little bit before, possibly a little bit after. So about the same time. Okay? Um, and Luke was written in the early 60s, so we won't even look at Luke. We'll just look at Matthew and Mark here. And Matthew 120 says this. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. This is Matthew who wrote this, who was one of the twelve, also called Levi. Um, Mark was not one of the twelve, but it is assumed that he took his account from uh, Peter, um, who was one of the twelve. Not only was he one of the twelve, but he was one of the closest three. There were, you know, the three, the twelve, the seventy. He was one of the three. Um, and so there's that to consider, too. Luke, uh, I mean, he he went and, and talked to the, to, to the people firsthand. He wasn't one of the twelve, but he, he personally investigated the things, much like a journalist would today. Um, and to, so to say that the apostles knew nothing, we're just remember, we're just looking at Matthew's account, which was around the 50s somewhere, the same time as Romans. And he claims, you know, yeah. it just doesn't follow there. Um, also, the Old Testament mentioned the the um, the uh, virgin birth long before Isaiah's dated somewhere around the like I think 800 somewhere. I, I forget the exact date, but somewhere in like the nine to seven hundred somewhere in that period there. That sets BC. I mean, that's far before Jesus ever came. And uh, he prophesied about it. Isaiah 7.14 says this. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Um, also, uh, he kind of... Over, he kind of misses the point on the on his on his argument here. He said he uses Romans one three through four as his proof text, right? But in Romans six twenty three, regardless of the virgin birth, um, Paul says this about it: um, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So I mean. The rest of the Old Testament scripture talked about the, the Messiah coming with the virgin birth here. And, I mean, and, and, and so now we've gotten to this point. And so to go on, on a leap like this and say the apostles knew nothing of the virgin birth without proof and relying on Romans, whereas Matthew and Mark both predate Romans, that's a little bit of a stretch. Uh -huh. So I don't know. Um, once again, a lot of these things, I want you to understand that you could take them – the way that he's saying. But it's a little bit of a hasty conclusion to say this is how it is definitely, and so I'm going to disprove it. God, Christianity is not what it, sh what it should be just because of this. So, I mean, it's very vague what-ifs a lot of the times. And a lot of the things that he has to say were very ambiguous like that. Um, also, uh, don't forget the, that the birth was not the most important aspect of Jesus yeah. that – they, they wanted to record. Only two of the Gospels even mention his his birth. 
Okay. Uh, Matthew and Luke. Yeah, Luke. Matthew and Luke. Um, Mark goes straight to John the Baptist, and John talks about the pre-incarnate Jesus. So, I mean... <laughs> I don't think that they were overly concerned about the birth anyways. But as far as Romans 1, um, it's very clear that Paul did uh, did believe in the virgin birth. He just didn't talk about it here. If you look at 1, 2, it says, As the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures. So he's alluding back to the Old Testament. And he says, Regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David. Um, and that was is like came to be. Excuse me. So once again, he's not saying that he was a descendant of David by physical means. He's not saying that. So I mean, and that's what he's taken it to mean is that Paul was trying to argue that that Jesus came uh, through David by physical means. He had a physical father and a physical mother. Um, but obviously, that's not what he's not what he's saying. He came to be because he was that was the family line the Holy Spirit used. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. Through Mary. Um, also in verse 4 it says that, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead Jesus Christ our Lord in other words his resurrection validated his claims if Christ had not resurrected he indeed would not have been the Christ but it was pr the proof of him being the Christ was that he in fact did resurrect um, so I, I think that all things considered, it's a little bit of a leap to say that the apostles knew nothing of the virgin birth. It's a little bit of a leap. Um, Jesus said he wanted to offer nothing to the Gentiles. Um, actually, this is a very common, um, common misunderstanding. People think that Jesus just came for the Jews and everything else is just kind of made up along the way. And for that, let's look at a few of the, a few of the passages that, that they take. The first one is Matthew 10.5. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions, do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. And then in 1521 through 28. Yeah. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and is suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, Send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. And then Galatians 2, 11 through 14. passage there. Galatians 2, 11 through 14. When Cephas, who is Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles, but when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. Basically, his argument here is even that even Peter himself didn't think that the, that the <coughs> Gentiles were worth going to. Um, the other Jews joined him in, in this hypocrisy, and so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. Now, you'll remember Barnabas in the book of Acts uh, was one of the people who Paul initially uh, got acquainted with in the church, uh, and he did his first missionary journey with him as well. Um, and it seems like they only split up after the, after Paul or at the beginning of Paul's second missionary journey. So they spent quite a few years together. Um, when I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, You are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow, follow Jewish customs? So let's look at these one by one. First, Jesus sends out the twelve. And we're going to talk about this next year, the promised plan of God, the single um, most unifying theme in all of Scripture that all of Scripture is based on. And we'll look at that next year. Um, but... Uh, Right now, it's just what's important is Israel was tasked with the covenant with God in order that light may come to the Gentiles. However, they got a little bit 
was it called ethnocentric or whatever? They basically they thought that it was Jewish superiority. God only loved Jewish the Jews, and then he wanted to destroy everyone else. They kind of misunderstood scripture. And once again, we'll talk about that next year. Um, but so they had a greater responsibility. So as a result, when Jesus came, he first went to the Jews before going to the Gentiles because they were his, his supposed to be his holy nation. Therefore, he had to start the correction there before he went out to the rest of the world. Does that make sense? Um, and he talks about this in other places, or Paul talks about it in other places, I should say. And how we know that this is a thing is because if you look at the end of Matthew, this is the very last, this is what he took this from, Matthew 10.5. If you go to the very end of Matthew, it says this. Um, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, no, spe no specifications, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So what we see there, same book, okay, and there's no evidence of, of, of manuscript tampering. There's no evidence that, that, that that was something that was added later. So as far as we can tell, and if you follow Matthew's theme and his outline, it's very evident that Jesus was, you know, came first to the Jews, then to the Gentiles. Just the same pattern that, that Paul followed uh, when he went to different places to minister. Um, and so he, he sets up the, this, this ministry, but it's very important to note that. Um, so then that takes us to uh, the 15, verse 21 through 28, the second place that he claims to, to whatever from. By this point, Jesus had already healed many Gentiles. So we know that his purpose here must have been more than simply denying a Gentile when he had accepted all those other Gentiles he had healed at this point. Okay, just throwing that out. But then if you look, where was he? Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Why did he go to the land of the Gentiles if he had no intention of healing the Gentiles? Based on that, we can assume that his intent here was not to reject her, but to get her to seek. And to show the example that faith can come from Gentiles too. Because the Jews thought that true faith could only come from the Jews. And yet we have a Gentile here showing true faith. Um, and another reason why we, why we know that Jesus' intention was to heal her all along is because he healed her. Right. Right. If God didn't intend to heal her, he would have stuck with his word and said no. Yeah. Yeah. See what I mean? So that kind of overlooks all the evidence. Now let's look at Galatians 2, 11-14. What Paul is talking about here is there's something there was something at the time very dangerous called Judaizers, and what this is is someone who thought you had to fulfill either parts or or main part or main segments of the law in order to be saved. You had to basically complement your faith with the different things. Circumcision was a big thing um, because that was a sign of the covenant, which Moses was almost killed for because he didn't have the sign of the covenant on his firstborn. If you remember the story in Exodus, um, so it was kind of a big theme for the Jews, um, and that was one of the things. Uh, but then also uh, how what they ate, you know, the, they had to live by certain diet, uh, uh, customs and customs and diets. Um, so at this, we have Peter, who is who is living. It says here, "You are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile, not like a Jew." Basically, what he's saying is you're not living according to the law, but you're living according to the law of grace that Jesus gave you. So then, how is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? Why, if you are a Jew and you are not living like a Jew, but as you are now free, why are you holding the Gentiles to the Jewish standard rather than your same standard? He's basically saying you're being a hypocrite here because you are a Jew and you're not following it. Why are you making them follow it? Yeah. Um, and so that, that's all that he's talking about. Here is the way that Peter got intimidated among the crowds. And so he decided to withdraw. He's not saying that Peter was condoning this attitude. In fact, later on, we find Peter and Paul on the same page. In Acts 15, they have the apostolic council. Peter and Paul conclude the exact same thing. We should make salvation harder for them. In fact, when James says that, we should, in, in, in chapter 15 of Acts, James says, we shouldn't be making it any harder for the Gentiles to be saved. And, and Peter and Paul both agree with them. In fact, Paul was arguing just days before with Barnabas to the to people against this. So then when they got to the Apostolic Council, they were all in agreement about this. Um, and then uh, towards the end of Peter's life in the 60s, um, uh, a few years before he was killed, um, I believe in 1st or 2nd Peter, I'm not sure which, 
Um, but uh, he, he, he talks about Paul in positive terms. You know, Paul writes about this in all of his letters, which the unstable person takes out of context. And he's all, you know, he's ta he's he's talking about good things with with Paul. He didn't have anything bad to say about Paul. So, you know, we can assume that Paul agreed with Peter's message. Peter ass agreed with Paul's message. I'm sorry, I got those names confused. Peter agreed with Paul's message, and there's no evidence contrary. So, anything uh, other than that would be pure speculation to say that yes. Um, Jesus didn't want anything to do to do with the Gentiles, and that was just something that happened later. There's no proof for that, none whatsoever. Um, so then, also Romans one sixteen says this, um, which once again is one of the parts that this claim kind of ignores. He was very one sided, and you'll notice this with a lot of people who have big things against the Bible. Oh, well, the Bible this, the Bible that. Okay, now hold on, you're just not understanding it correctly. Like one of the biggest. Uh, Stumbling Stones is the book of Leviticus, and people like Richard Dawkins and whatever always take it way out of context and abuse the crap out of it just because that's the only leverage they can get. So then for someone like us who actually knows how to ap apply Leviticus, see what I mean? It's just like, well, that's not really how you understand that book. You understand what I mean? And so you have to kind of wade through the stuff to, to kind of prove it. Does that make sense? You kind of have to wade through their arguments in order to affirm the truth. Uh, Romans 1.16 says, uh, For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. See? So, once again, and Paul talks about this later, God doesn't have any favoritism between Jew and Gentile. So, um, any questions on either of those so far? Comments? Okay. Um, in Matthew... Um, through Luke, Jesus says nothing to think of him as. I'm sorry. Jesus says not to think of him as God. So basically, this claim is that Matthew, Mark, and Luke all see Jesus as not necessarily God. They don't. They don't say anything about it. So for that, we go to Mark 10:18, which is what he takes as proof. Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, No one is good except God alone. And it sounds like this is a good argument, except for when you actually start start paying attention to Scripture, and, and that's exactly what I'll, what I'll do right here. First thought, different Gospels are written for different intents and purposes. Matthew, for instance, is more concerned with the Jewish. He, he talks about a lot more about uh, prophecy, he talks a lot more about Jesus as the Messiah, as the King. Um, Mark is, is very short and to the point. Um, doesn't really hem haw around with with different things. Uh, Luke is more concerned with the historical setting of what's going on. John is more concerned with just proving that Jesus is God. I mean, that, he definitely is writing with that bias. He's not even concerned necessarily about the order of events or anything like that. His only point is to show Jesus is God, which once again, bias doesn't mean something isn't true. So, um, but uh, also uh, his claim ignores the context. Um, this man is clearly one, someone who's trying to earn salvation through works. If you look at this, look, look at the conversation. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher. Good teacher. And watch this. He asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, what did he call him? Good teacher, right? Okay. Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not uh, defraud. Um... You shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. Um, now, if you remember, Jesus, is, Jesus has said that the most important commandment was to love God and love your neighbor, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, he, he just went through giving him this, like, half-hearted answer. Then what does the guy say to him? Teacher, he declared. He didn't say good teacher the second time, did he? Uh -uh. See, Jesus is challenging his opinion of what is good. He wants him to understand what is truly good. And so, so now, in a little bit of a, sh a little bit ashamed, he drops the good from it. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. I'm faultless. I have earned my salvation. <laughs> Jesus looked at him and, lo and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go, sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have the treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. What is Jesus' point? Not everybody has to give everything they have. His heart wasn't on God. It was on his things. Look at, oh, this is how we know. At this, the man's face fell. Why would Mark have gone to the bother of saying that his face fell? Why not just say that he walked away? 
See what I mean? He's, he's trying to show the kind of setting that's going on here. He went away sad because he had great wealth. See, Mark even goes to the extent of explaining, in case you missed it, he had great wealth. Um, and so this guy is trying to earn his way through salvation, and that's the context there. Jesus is just challenging his opinion of what is good and what's not good. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. And, and then he goes on with his discussion there. But basically, to take that one passage and to say, make that conclusion that Jesus doesn't want us to think of him as God is a little bit unfair. Now let's look at the rest of the entire book of Mark and show how Mark is showing that Jesus is God. Starts off in Mark 1. A good place to start if you're trying to prove something says something. Start at the beginning. <laughs> Mark 1, um, 1 through 3 says this. In the, beginning of the, in the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, so right off he starts calling him, calling him the Messiah. Right. Interesting. The Son of God, okay, let's keep going just in case you know you missed something. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared. See what I mean? And then after John the Baptist, who prepared the way, we have Jesus entering the scene. So what is he saying? Jesus is the Lord that John was preparing the way for. See what I mean? So you have to really ignore the, the context of Mark to draw that kind of a conclusion. Let's go on with and, and there are people who have gone through all of Mark showing um, showing how intent Mark was, how, how focused Mark was on proving Jesus as God. I didn't want to... Um, Include that because I mean honestly, the, the one of the um, articles I was reading, he went on for like I think it was twelve pages, just wow. plowing through Mark, showing chapter after chapter how Mark was proving time and time again. Huh. So I just I just pulled out the things that I thought were important. Um, Mark chapter two. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. I'm going to twelve. Um, some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat, and the man was lying on it. I'm sorry, uh, the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. Okay, so already we have him forgiving sins, and we have him reading people's minds, basically. Uh -huh. Okay, but remember, this, Mark isn't trying to show that he's God. And he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up, take your mat, and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So I said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. So he didn't just say that the person's sins were forgiven. He backed it up by showing them with healing that he had, in fact, done the thing that he had said that he did. So then that, that, that obviously spurred on the question of where does he get this power from, which the Pharisees were stupid enough to ask him. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you guys remember that story. And he says, Who, where did John get his, his power from? And then he goes on talking about how uh, Satan can't have war against himself or else his house would collapse. Anyways, um, so uh, we have him doing a lot of things that only God could do. In fact, Mark saw fit to put in there specifically that they said that in their hearts. Only God can do this. And then he proved that Jesus did really do that. So <laughs> I think Mark might be a little bit more interested than just simply throwing random details in there. Or Peter, if Peter had more um, say-so in, in the order of events um, as Mark was recording. For, uh, 1460 says this. Um, then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Now, why this struck such a, a harsh note with, no, not harsh notes, but a hard swallow note with the Pharisees is because he was alluding to uh, Daniel where it says that the Ancient of Days was, was, was with the Son of Man. This would mean that, that Jesus was the ultimate authority, and that that's exactly what he was claiming, and the, and the high priest would have known that 
being very t skilled in, in the law. So he's not just saying a random thing. He's saying something that very clearly the high priest knew exactly what he was saying. And Mark recorded it to show that he was, in fact, um, the Messiah. Um, <clears throat> also, uh, John the Baptist role, and I'll look at this and, and, and here in a few more points, he's going to bring up something about John the Baptist, think, saying that basically claiming that, that John, uh, the Gospel of John, um, added stuff to what John the Baptist said. And we'll look at that in a second. But don't forget that John the Baptist's role was to proclaim the way of Yahweh. That was his own. That was his only goal. He was sent for that purpose, and once that purpose was completed, and Jesus took his ministry, he was taken out of the picture by being arrested and later beheaded. So uh, that was what what his ministry was about. Um, also, once again, um, to claim that Jesus didn't want didn't want people to think of him as God ignores the larger prophetic narrative. All of, well, I already talked about this. All of Matthew talks continually about Jesus fulfilling those the, those prophecies. Talks about Jesus the Messiah. Mark, I just went through that. Um, and Luke does similar things too, but I, I think Matthew kind of focuses more on that whole Jewish background there. Um, any questions on that one? Okay. Um, the re re resurrection appearances are irre irreconcilable. Basically, that they're just so different that they couldn't possibly all be true. But as we looked at before a couple a couple months ago when we were looking at the at, and um you know the um errors in the Bible when we were looking at that a few months ago we I read you that excerpt from one of Blomberg's books uh, Jesus and the Gospels where he detailed how it's easily possible you know this person went and they arrived there first and these people arrived there later then they went here see what I mean and, and just because each of the Gospels highlights different points doesn't mean that they're not all true. They just wanted to a highlight different aspects of what was happening that day. It was a very busy day. If you read through all, all four Gospels, yeah. people were running back and forth all, all throughout that day. They, you know, there was a lot going on. And that's exactly what the Gospels say, I believe, in John. Um, says that he appeared at many times in many ways. I believe it's John that says that. Regardless, um, you know, John himself admits that, that there was a lot going on that day. Um, and then also throughout the uh, next couple months, months too. Um so basically, to draw the conclusion that they're irreconcilable—that's a hard word to say—irreconcilable um, is a pretty hasty conclusion based on your own bias. To to immediately hop to that conclusion, I'm not even going to try to see if I can make a historical timeline. I'm just going to throw it out the window and say no. Why hop so quickly to that to that conclusion? See what I mean? That's not based off of fact or lack of fact. It's based off of his bias. Um, which, once again, I, I get the feeling that he did this. He went to, if any Bible school, just a very limited education and, you know, served for a while um, and then, you know, started reading books like the Da Vinci Code and got caught up in, in the, those kinds of things and got kind of confused at the time. And he just got all bitter about it. And so he just decided to quit the ministry. And that's why he's not a pastor anymore. I imagine something like that happened because anybody who is actually researching these things I mean, half of the things I've resolved simply by looking elsewhere in the exact same book that he previously mentioned. Right. I didn't even have to turn to a different book of the Bible. I, I looked at the books that he brought up himself. This is the only one that you'd have to look outside of the Bible to get an, someone else's opinion to help you understand it better. Yeah. That This is the only one so far. So I, I, I think that maybe he was someone who, who just was preaching something that he didn't really encounter. Uh -huh. That makes sense. And then when he started reading things, and, and and that's one of the things I was trying to warn you guys about with, with um, studying, you know, about these different things. Don't fall in that pit, and when you're when you with your knowledge, where, where you just you start studying and you and you're oh this is the truth, and you just stop there. Keep studying. Keep studying. Keep studying. Um, it's like people who are afraid that science is one get in one day going to disprove the Bible. Keep studying. Just keep studying. Just keep studying. Um, so, any questions about this one? I'm not. I didn't really go into reconciling it because we already did that a few months ago, and I didn't see the point of repeating a lesson. So, yeah. if you're interested, it's in Jesus and the Gospels by Craig Blomberg. It's on page four thirteen. Now, that's the second edition. I don't know what it is on the first edition. Um, Jesus was against public prayer. 
for this, we look at Matthew 6. And basically his claim here is, you know, for those people who, who pray in public, like uh, prayer at the pole and stuff, this is something that Jesus w wasn't even for anyways. So let's look at that and see if uh, there's any basis for this claim. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Now he's talking about giving specifically, but... He, he says something that applies to what he's going to be talking about here in the next next bit. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others. Okay, um, And he just got done talking about loving your enemies. In other words, not being sure with your love for enemies, but actually loving them from your heart. Then he goes on to, on to doing things from your heart rather than just for show. And then he goes to prayer. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing. In, now, hold on. Let's stop there. How do we know that these aren't just disconnected things that, that Matthew just threw together? Based off of what I just read, how do we know that? Because it's kind of a list of things. Do not do this, do not do that. So it goes together. Also, he wouldn't just throw random things together. It seems like it's a theme throughout the Bible that things link very on purpose. Not that I don't like your answer. I just want to see if see if I can get any more. Anybody else? I, 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 I don't not like your answer. I'm just... Is it the writing style? Uh, no, like, that's not what I was... Like, you know, this and this and this. And this. You, well, yeah, I mean, I guess that has something to do with it. Yeah, but that's also not what I was really um, looking for. But I, I liked your answers. I'm not... On, I don't want you to be think that I'm not liking your answers. <laughs> This is Matthew 6, 1 through 6. No, I'm looking it up my Bible. Maybe because you have to look at the people that he was addressing. The good answer, too. But I was actually talking about the content of what, what we oh. what we read. I should have specified. So I'm sorry. That was my fault. Re uh, re mm -hmm. Restate what you said, then. How do you know that Matthew is not just simply um, having a bunch of random quotes from Jesus and how these the prayer thing goes hand in hand with what he said about not practicing righteousness? Because it's in the same chapter, so I'm just <laughs> <laughs> That was funny. I liked that answer. That was, that was funny. It's a very important but very small word. I'll read it again. Tell me if you catch it. Then your father who sees what is done secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. And. And. In Greek, kai. And even also, namely, it carries over the thought. In other words, I'm talking about this. This also applies to this. Oh, See what I mean? Okay. He didn't just okay. conclude, move on. He connected what he was saying with kai. Um, for they ha love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. For when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now, let me stop there. All the things that you said were true, and what you said were true too. Um, you know, depending on what he, who he was talking to, on the way that Gospels are written, that kind of stuff. is All that was true. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, so now going back to my point here. Um, he doesn't say that he's against public prayer. He says that he's against showy prayer. He uses what's called an extreme example. Go into the innermost place when you pray. Let nobody know. When you give to the needy, don't even let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. Is he saying that your right and left hand have brains of their own? Yeah. No, he's not saying that. He's using an extreme contrast. Actually, Jesus used extreme contrasts a lot. Yes. A lot. If you read through the Gospels, note how many times he uses extreme contrasts. When you, uh, if something's causing you to sin, pluck out your eyeball. Do you really think he's expecting people to, you know, <laughs> no. It's, it's an extreme example with extreme contrasts. He's basically saying to abstain from these things, to draw as far away from them as you can. And Paul right. picks up on that too. Um, but anyways, um, so Joy, and Jesus was against showy prayers or dead prayers. 
That's what he was against. Um, it also, it ignores the Old Testament example of people praying together in public. Ever read through the books of Kings and Chronicles, where the kings pray openly in public? Where David led led people in prayer? Where Solomon gathers everybody when the temple is, is built, finished being built, and he has that thing, and they have the, the prayer with everyone there? And I think it's Joshua or Judges... Um, where they do that big prayer with everyone there. Samuel, I think, has a, a big public prayer. You know, what about all those examples? Are you saying that God didn't like any of those? How come God responded to, to, to many of them? How come when, when Solomon had his little prayer and when the temple was being being um, was finished being being built, why did God respond to that prayer if he didn't even like it? See what I mean? He doesn't care as to whether people see you pray or not. That's not the point. Like, people have gone overboard with this about the whole fasting thing. If you fast and somebody hears that you have fasted, it's ruined. Ruined. <laughs> it's like if you if you are fasting and you actually eat something that you said you wouldn't, ruined. It's like, whoa, whoa, let's calm down with that. You know what I mean? What it, it, it's, You're just ignoring what the Bible has to say about it by saying that. Um, or just assuming that the Bible has is completely chaotic and none of it connects with each other. Which I guess that would be a view to, if you could potentially hold. Uh, one passage such as this is insufficient to form a doctrine that Jesus was against public prayer anywhere at any time. Yeah. One passage is not sufficient enough to form a doctrine off of. But he's been telling us this whole year. Yes, exactly. And it's odd that he didn't just stop at, at this. It's odd that he didn't stop at drawing into a cult because this is the same kind of line of thinking that a cult uses he took passages out of context he didn't he didn't look at hermeneutics and the study of how to understand the bible he didn't um uh he built uh, ideas off of single passages you know so i mean he did everything that we told i told you not to do over the past two years yeah. so i anyways um this is the point and the context of the passage I already talked about the context and the points so i'm not going to go into that again but any questions on that okay so serena didn't didn't sin when she did a public prayer after worship that day and lauren last sunday she didn't sin either right 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 okay just making sure we're all on the same page i'm really worried about that. <laughs> <laughs> but she totally sinned when she told us that she fed the homeless guy the other day <laughs> awesome. Um, some some books of the Bible are forgeries. This is actually what? something that that a lot of a lot, I, mean, I, I talked about this in the New Testament class repeatedly. Yeah, you did. Um, a lot of people, um, you know, oh well, it's he uses different vocabulary in the in this book from this this letter from this letter, so that means it must be somewhere else. Or um, he was talking about stuff that we don't even think that that existed back then, so it couldn't have mixed, it couldn't have happened. <laughs> Do you have any proof that it didn't exist back then, or like Gnosticism? Well, this is clearly he's he, clearly he's talking about Gnostic thought, and that didn't exist for another hundred years. So you know, well, at least its predecessor existed because he's talking about it, and you have no proof contrary. So, see what I mean? You can't hop to hop to such final conclusions on limited evidence, very limited evidence. Um, I mean, if you want to hop on the realm of possibility, you can make all kinds of things up. There could have been another another world out there somewhere where aliens are currently living that we are blocked off from, but that they received the gospel too, um, except an angel died for them, whereas Jesus died for us. And you see what I mean, you could form all these crazy doctrines that are not based on any fact or proof whatsoever. But here in the world of the living, we like to actually look at science and facts to, to, to substantiate claims. So... With a lot of these things, that's what you have to do. Just, whoa, hold on. What are they claiming? And then kind of look at it and, you know. Um, so first off, no substantial proof any either way. Second off, and we talked about this in, in the New Testament class, at the times that the epistles were being written, there were things called amanuenses. Amanuenses. And amanuenses. Ah, there we go. I figured out a way to say it. These are pe people, basically, who would smooth over what you were trying to say. Because yeah. not everybody was very skilled at writing. Like, for instance, Paul was probably not fantastic at writing. He was probably pretty good, but probably not the best. And so what they would do is they would either write for you or they would take what you've written and smooth it over and make it better. We see this in First Peter to Second Peter. First Peter is, is good. Second Peter is terrible. I believe Second Peter is, this, is the worst Greek in the entire New Testament, if I remember correctly. In the entire New Testament. Wow. That's what you'd expect from a fisherman, wouldn't you? Yeah. 
yeah. Who was on his deathbed about to die, just wanted to scribble some things down before he died. Right? Yeah. That's what I would expect from him. Okay. Maybe he didn't have anyone else there to, to smooth it over. A good example. Um, so you can't just ignore historical facts. This was something that not just biblical writers, other people use this too. Okay, this is this is a historical fact of what these people actually existed. Um, also, this view overly plays the differences and ignores the similarities. Like, for instance, oh, this book of Paul and this book of Paul, they're just so different. Well, okay, they have a different audience, a different purpose. They're written at a different time, stage in Paul's life, written at a different stage of the church's existence where that problem wasn't even – like, for instance, in Paul's earlier writings, Judaism was a, was a bigger problem. In his later writings, Gentile thought was a bigger problem. So, I mean, there was a, there was a shift that was going on in the church. By, by 20 years into the church's existence, Judaism was getting to be not so much of a prominent thing, to, thing anymore. Why? Because they'd been combating it for 20 years. What were you going to say? I was, like, was going to say that's actually a good point that it's written to different people. He may have gotten – he may have written or had – other people smooth it over in different ways yeah. for the people to understand it. Yes, exactly. Like, for instance, Timothy, who was a very close friend of him and his mentee, he would have probably written differently than an entire church that he was written to in Philippians. Right. And also he was in prison in Philippians, whereas in First Timothy he was not, and Second Timothy he was. See what I mean? So different circumstances, different audiences, different – were you going to say something else? Well, I was going to say you wouldn't use the same vocabulary as you would if you were writing to a doctor than if you were writing to a farmer. Right. right. Th that is true. Yeah. Not to not to put this too – don't read too much into this, but kind of dumb down what you're saying. Uh, contextualize that for the person. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. Um, good, good points. Good points. Um but a lot of times, people who talk about the about the books of the Bible being forgeries, or whatever, this is what they do. They they harp so much on the differences, but they completely ignore the similarities. Huh. Like, like we see this with the Gospels a lot. Oh, they're just so different, you can't reconcile. Okay, all of them claim that Jesus is God, that Jesus came and was fully human, that he died on a cross, that he was resurrected. All of them agree on the on the core of his doctrine. They they may they may vary in the way that it's said. They may vary in the order it's presented, and they may vary in the details of certain things like here and there. But they say the exact same thing. See what I mean? So to then immediately hop to the conclusion that it's fake or it's made up, it's a little bit of a leap. Yeah. You can't leap like that with historical documents. You can't do that. Um, <clears throat> all the church leaders accepted them, and they were widespread. All the church leaders accepted the books of the Bible, and they were widespread throughout the areas of the, where the church yeah. existed. So either they were fooled, which doesn't bode very well for them, does it? Uh -huh. Or they accepted the lies, knowing that it was from someone else other than who it claimed to be. And then, um, what is that word? Um, propagated? No, um, endorsed the lies to then be sent to more people saying, oh yeah, it's Paul's letter, just take that. When they would have known that it wasn't Paul's letter. Right, so well either they were idiots or they were lying or it really wasn't Paul. So once again, <laughs> logically, I don't think that the church would have been that easily fooled after you know, the different tradition they are already started to develop. A lot of them knowing these people, yeah. not enough time passing. It's just so many different things that you have to depend on. These the perfect storm of of, of different things that could have happened to, to cause this this unrecordable phenomenon in the early church. Okay, but all the data says that, that didn't happen. So I, I don't know. I feel like that there may be some basis on some of the claims about the forgeries, but overall I see no compelling evidence to accept the claim absolute claim that. Yes, the Bible, the books of the Bible are forgeries. Um, so let's look at a few of the things that, that really bothered him. First thought off that he took was um, were the were the two two very controversial passages that Paul writes, and he says basically uh, Paul is a sexist, and people just added that to take away the woman's place in the church. Well, let's look at that claim. And people, all, people will often claim this, that everywhere that the Christian church went, women lost their freedom. That's actually not true. Everywhere that the Christian church went, women gained freedom. Okay, I want that established. They gained, they gained a place in, 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 in the organization. Um, 1 Peter 2, 11 through 15. 
A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. So he takes that and he says, okay, first off, um, women have to have kids to be saved. I thought it was about faith in Christ. Then he, then he, then he talks about, well, okay, he's saying that women have to, have to basically shut up and let the men do everything. Well, once again, not exactly. A chiasm is something that follows. A, 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 who here likes poetry? You okay? Do you remember? Do you guys? Do you guys remember in high school? Um, I think they. I think they still call it chiasm in, in, in English. I don't know. Yeah, we did lots of that. A B B A, A B B A. You guys remember that? It was kind of a kind of a thing like this. It looked like a V that was tilted on its side. Yeah. This point would be the same with the last point. The middle point would be your most important point. Mm -hmm. You know, and it would kind of go like yes. that. Okay. This uses that. This uses that also. A woman should learn quietness and full submission. Why? Because Adam was not was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. Okay. I do not permit a woman to teach her to assume authority over a man. Why? Because Adam was not. I'm sorry. Because Adam was formed first, then Eve. What is his What is his primary purpose? The thing that's in the middle of this chiasm. She must be quiet. So now we look. What is this word quiet? It basically, I, without getting too much into Greek, basically um, uh, respectful in tone, um, not uh, arrogant or loud mouthed. Talks about earlier that like kings have to be quiet too. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's another important thing. Is actually he uses the exact same word in this yeah. very book. Um, I believe it's in the early in the exact same chapter. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives. Yeah. It's exact same word. Right. Exact same word. Um, and thank you for bringing that up. I would have probably just forgotten it. Um, and so what he's saying here is this. Um, first off, let's take this apart. A woman should learn. This doesn't really captivate it. The Greek is more of an imperative. A woman must learn. Basically, what he's saying here is women at this time were not very educated. So what is he saying? Rectify that. They should learn. You can't just let them dwell in their ignorance. You have to let them learn. So that's the first important thing. That was already a spin on the popular theology of the day because women, I mean, come on. See what I mean? But what Paul said was, no, 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 no. They must learn. Um, which could be associated with the fact that, once again, a lot of the gossip could have potentially been been being spread through the older women who are just being busybodies and gossips. Mm. Possible. Not. Don't read too much into that. Um, I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. Um, basically, some people just say, it's, well, it's, it, long story short, some people say that he's talking about women in leadership. He hasn't started talking about leadership yet. He starts talking about leadership in Chapter 3. So I don't think that's what he's talking about. Here he's talking about relations between man and woman as it applies to the church. So I think that we to assume that it's applying to the leader is a little bit a little bit much. Um, basically, um, he he's doing a little bit of a play on words here. But long story short, he's basically saying that the husband is the head of the house, and the woman must not try to take that place is basically what he's talking about. Rather, the woman's demeanor, how she lives, how she presents herself, should be in a respectful way. Mm -hmm. That's basically what he's saying. Mm -hmm. So then that takes us to the last bit there. But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. Makes it sound like he's saying you have to have kids as a woman in order to be saved. But this is actually what he's saying. So there's a few things to, to consider. First off, women in, 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 in Ephes uh, Ephesus Timothy was in Ephesus, right? I'm having a huge brain fart. Timothy was in Ephesus. Yeah. Sorry. Women in Ephesus would pray to, to a, a patron deity, basically. Um, she was a goddess. Uh, it, it, in order that, that they would survive um, survive their pregnancy. He's obviously alluding to that, but to what capacity is still debated. Um, but then also there's the, there's the pre-Gnostic thought that women had to be like men in order to be saved, and that if they had kids, they could potentially lose their salvation because the flesh was solely evil and they had to completely reject it. And there are some other thoughts like that going along. And all things considered, without getting too much into this, since I, you do have to be home sometime tonight, um, um, he's, he's saying um, that women will not lose their, lose their salvation 
through childbearing. You can go ahead and have kids. What's really important is that you continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. That's what he's saying. Kids are not going to cause you to lose your salvation. If what's going to cause you going to cause you to lose your salvation if you don't is you, if you don't continue in faith, love, and holiness with, with propriety. Because what happens when we don't do that? We give ourselves to all kinds of other things, don't we? If we don't continue in faith, the righteous live by faith. But if they're not living by faith, see what I mean? Yeah. Um, then uh, love. That's one of the things that John even said. You know, was how people will know that you are a Christian is by your love. Um, and holiness, obviously, Jesus and God said, "Be holy, for I am holy," and which is reiterated all throughout the Bible. And then with propriety, because that just makes sense. Um, any questions on that passage? So once again, not sexist at all. First off, if you read it without taking any of the historical cues, then it's sexist. But if you look out back on it for what it was, women should learn. Women shouldn't try to take take the position from their husband because that's their position. Rather, they should try and they should focus on being respectful, presenting themselves in a respectful way, um, and uh, don't don't worry about having kids. You're not going to lose your, you're not going to lose your salvation off of it. Nothing sexist there. So, First Corinthians um, eleven, and do stop me if you have any questions. I'm trying not to let this part take too long. All my whole point purpose here is that he he did very poor Bible study and he denied it to compensate for it. I'm not going to put forth the work to actually study this passage because it's too difficult. So I'm just going to deny that it was ever a part of the Bible because it's it just it's just easier. That's not professional. First um, Corinthians 11 or 14, sorry. 14 says something that all other people also get a little bit confused about. Uh, 34 through 35, women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, must be in submission as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should uh, ask their own husbands at home, for it is disgraceful for women to speak in the church. First off, what is he talking about? Order in the church with the gifts of the Spirit, right? Mm -hmm. So we know that whatever he's talking about has to do something with that. Second off, as far as the specifics, and there's my alarm. As far as the specifics, we can delve into the passage itself to answer some of the questions. If they want to inquire about something, so we know whatever they're talking about, they were they were causing a ruckus with the way that they were talking, um, they should ask their own husbands at home. Okay, so we've got basically an assumed conclusion. These women were causing causing a lot of disturbance because they were you know they were. Um, they're talking probably loudly given the context um, or asking questions causing a disturbance. So how, what, what does this mean for us today? Don't be chaotic in your worship. Basically what it comes down to. Don't cause distractions in, in the way that the worship is. See what I mean? That's basically what it can all be summated as. Which this is a message that applies to men today too. Just because the men weren't in Corinth causing a problem doesn't mean that the men today are not causing a problem. Right. Um, so um, with that being said though, uh, once again, the the remain silent. I don't have time to do a do to talk too much into this. But Corin, Paul already assumed that women were going to be talking because he talked about women praying out loud. He talked about the gifts of the spirit out loud, and so to then say that Paul is being sexist here is a little bit out of place. Especially it seems how well I think that's good enough. Um, so always watch this with people who deny the Bible. They'll stop short of actually studying the Bible. And just draw a conclusion because they weren't willing to put forth the effort. Any questions about this? Long story short, there is no substantial evidence for the Bible being forgeries or for things being – major doctrine being added later. In fact, I'll go even a step later. The original Greek, man Greek manuscripts, the only places that were even a little bit curious about whether they were actually there are things that don't, don't change the doctrine at all. At all. Oh, in fact, I'll give you the, uh, the – I believe the two biggest ones. John chapter 8. Where the woman caught in an adultery, that isn't in the oldest oldest manuscripts. However, let's go ahead and take it out. Did we lose anything important? No, we didn't. John's message is maintained. The gospel's uh, core teaching is maintained. No, no major doctrine is lost. Uh, the second major one, the ending of Mark. This is probably how it, how it ended. And they ran away afraid and didn't tell anybody. Why? Because Mark wanted to show the inferiority of men and how, how, how foolish they were being and how Jesus was you know, the superior one, basically, without getting too much into this. Um, but then later was added on that thing about drinking the poison and being bitten by snakes, and that was, pro that was probably added on later. However, in your Bible, it will probably have all three endings. The, uh, the original one, the other one that's just a few, I think it's like a verse or two, and then the third one, which has the thing about the snakes and the poison. 
Does that make sense? Any doctrine lost? No. All the rest of the things can easily be rectified. Um, so, okay. A amazing what you find out when you actually know what you're talking about, though. Like, I actually know what I'm talking about with Greek, so when, I, when he says stuff like that, it's like, bull. Bull. Uh, parts of the Bible were written to disagree with other parts. Basically, he takes Psalm 51 as his example. And he says that, you know, this person wrote this thing, and the, somebody came along later, and they didn't like it, so they added the next part. Um, and I'll read you the, the verse so that you know what he's talking about. It's in Psalm 51, verses 16 through 19. You do not delight in sacrifices, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. So then he thinks that that's where the psalm originally ended, and then somebody just didn't like it, so they added this. May it please you to prosper Zion, to build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in the sacrifices of the righteous, and burnt offerings offered whole. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. So let's, let's kind of break this down into pieces, manageable tidbits. First off, it's a contrast, not a contradiction. And the first part here, he's talking about the way that sacrifices were how people were trying to earn God's favor in the foreign nations and in Israel. And he's showing it's what, what's in the heart that matters. But then God did also command in the law about the sacrifices. So a pure heart giving a sacrifice may you accept. How do we know that's what he's saying? Because that's what he just said. <laughs> that's what he just said. So hopping to the conclusion that somebody just added in later, where is your manuscript evidence for this? Right, some manuscripts, they all have them. So. I, I mean, once again, it, the Old Testament, you can't really do the same thing as you do with the New Testament as far as manuscripts, but it still does apply that there is no substantial evidence for saying, making such a claim. Also, it ignores the poetry of the psalm itself. Right. Um, contrast, not contradiction. Um, also, this points towards future salvation emphasis is on the heart. Um, he's pointing towards, obviously, uh, by, by the mention of Zion, he's mentioning, you know, the things that, that for the Christian becomes heaven and, and the contrite heart that will worship in spirit and in truth rather than at a specific place. The thing, same thing Jesus said in John 4 or something. So, um, so that one's, you know, easily rectified. John 1 is another one of the ones that he used, one, another one of the passages that he used. Uh, John 1, 29 through 31. And basically, this is what he says. All the other other Gospels who mention John mention that he came to, to preach about repentance alone. But John, no, he didn't like that. So he, he added in that Jesus had to be the sacrifice. 1, 29 through 30. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes in after me has surpa surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. So basically his claim is this, that John the Baptist was getting people saved. But then when Jesus came along, afterwards John the Apostle didn't like that, and so he added in that John the Baptist said this. Um, and so there's a few things to notice, and this is this is just a side note. The Greek style of writing is not an exact one, uh, especially in the way that the, the gospels were written and whatnot. It was a very oral oral culture. Um, so things you didn't have to capture word for word what people said, just the idea of what people said. In fact, that's what made you a good um, Greek good at Greek rhetoric rhetorician. Rhetoric, you know the word. Good at Greek rhetoric and good at, at your presentation was how well you could maintain what you're, whoever you were quoting, how well you could maintain their message. In fact, in, in, in some people have the idea, and this might be true, might be not, I haven't researched it, that if you could reword it in your own word in a masterful way, you were seen as even better. Wow. So John's having a different stylistic variation from Matthew, Mark, and Luke isn't that big of a deal anyways, yeah. given the context. However, that's just a side note. Um, this can this can be rectified because Matthew, Mark, and Luke say this is what John said, and this is all that John said. And John never said anything else. They don't they don't say that. John's the Gospel of John is is worried about something completely different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke were. So John the Baptist's purpose was only temporary, and John the Apostle mentions that. See, John the Baptist was kind of an in between guy. He was the middleman. He had the law and the covenant, right? Then you had Jesus. What was in between? John the Baptist. 
And John the Baptist was sent to pave the way for the Messiah. So what he what he did was a temporary thing. So was he doing the the repentance uh, doing uh, the repentance? Yes, he was doing the repentance thing by, by the by the by the river, okay, with the baptisms and all that stuff. Um, however, what he was doing was never meant to be the final step, and he knew that he wasn't meant to be the final step. That's why he said this one was more worthy because he can, he existed before me, therefore he surpassed me. That's that's John the Baptist's point. Don't get your eyes on me. I'm just I'm just the one crying in the wilderness, and that's why all the gospels mention that John the Baptist. Not all of them say that. The, all the gospels that I can remember at the time say that uh, that, that say that about uh, a voice proclaiming in the wilderness. So um, don't forget that John the Baptist's place was temporary. And we'll talk about that in, in the future. So we'll shoot through this last one really quick. This is the last point, that, the last of the eight things that he said. Um, let me kind of recap. Parts of the Bible were written to disagree with other parts. Um, some books of the Bible are forgeries. Jesus was against public prayer. The resurrection appearances are irreconcilable. In Matthew through Luke, Jesus said, says not to think of him as God. And Jesus said he wanted to offer nothing to the Gentiles. Oh, I'm sorry. That's eight there. No. Why did he say eight things if there's nine things? Uh, did it? The apostles knew nothing of the virgin birth. Jesus said he wanted to offer nothing to the Gentiles. In Matthew through Luke, Jesus says not to think of him as God. The resurrection appearances are ir irreconcilable. Jesus was against public prayer. Some books of the Bible are forgeries. Parts of the Bible were written to disagree with other parts. Oh, okay. Okay, <laughs> I miscounted. Okay, I scared myself there. I was like, what? There was nine things your pastor won't tell you about the Bible. Nine things! But okay, eight. We're good. Okay. The apostles of Jesus thought Paul was wrong. Basically, this is the, he's saying that, that Paul and the twelve were at odds with their doctrine. Well, eleven, because, you know, the one dude killed himself. Well, what, you get what I'm saying. Uh, and for that, he looks at two passages, Galatians 1, 6-9, and 2 Corinthians 11. Um Let's look at uh, Galatians first, uh, starting in chapter 1. I am, astonished, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidence, um, evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preached to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. So basically he draws this conclusion and says, oh, he must be talking about the eleven. He must be. <laughs> because of the strong wording that he said and you know this and that. It's like, okay, um, a little lacking on the proof, but let's say he's right. Let's say he is. Yeah. 2 Corinthians 11 5 says this I do not think I, I am in the least inferior to these super apostles and then again in verse 13 um, for such people are false apostles deceitful workers masquerading as apostles of Christ so then he says okay so these are definitely using those words super apostles this is definitely the 11 so first off let's let's analyze this these two books are written at different times Galatians is written in the late 40s St. Corinthians is written in the mid-50s. What happens between the 50s and the late 40s? The Apostolic Council that I previously mentioned, where Paul, Peter, James, and all the leaders were in agreement about it, weren't they? Uh -huh. Why didn't they call Paul out at that time? Right. Just saying. Kind of an important historical detail to, for him to just glaze over. Um, and also... The places were different. Do you guys know where Galatia is? The, the, the city of Galatia? It's in Asia, what, what the Romans called Asia Minor, over on this side, above Palestine. Do you guys know where Corinth is? Below Macedonia, on this side. Oh, jeez. Let me kind of clue you in here. Here's Corinth, here's Macedonia. You go through all of this, Bithynia's and, and all that's over here. Galatia's over here. There's a huge pool of water here in the middle. And here. Yeah. And then the Palestine's over here. So that's a little bit drastic, I would think. He's clearly talking about, in 2 Corinthians, he's clearly talking about people who are in the church right now at the time in Corinth. He doesn't talk about them in such a way that 
something was a problem. He was just with them a few years before. What, what happened? Yeah. Uh, that's a little bit of a leap. Um, tradition and record, uh, uh, tradition, church tradition and um, record is on Paul's side. Anything else is speculation. The church, everything we have says that Paul and Peter were all on good terms, and that you know the church, Paul was was just saying what the church itself agreed with. So you're a little bit hard pressed with no historical data whatsoever to make this claim. Once again, this guy did not seem very um, acquainted with history. But with that being said, I didn't just randomly pick him. Th this was actually um, one that I spent a good deal of time researching um, to to rebut his vo rebuttal his 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 points. And um, it was very similar with a lot of other uh, articles um, and, and published works. So it's not like I picked a bad argument. I, I picked one that was good. Um, Galatians um, is about Judaizers that are adding works to the law. How does this have anything to do with the leaven? <laughs> Saying Corinthians has to do with false apostles associating themselves with the leaven – their teaching was based on arrogance while charging the people for their service and not Paul's corruption of the message. So once again, wow. what, is the, what, is what, they, what they were doing have anything to do with the leaven either? These are people who are, who, are basing, who are teaching from a wrong heart and charging for it. And that's one of the things that, that was irritating Paul is the way that he was taking it, they were taking advantage of them. Do you know what I mean? And so what does that have to do with the, with the leaven? Those two passages are not sufficient enough to say the apostle of Jesus thought that, thought that Paul was wrong. It's purely speculation at this point. Um, also, it, it ignores um, – this claim ignores act, the, the book of Acts. It, it, it ignores its account of Paul's unity with the rest of the church. Don't forget that, that Peter at the end of his life is talking about nothing wrong. Okay? Don't forget that Paul, at the end of his life, is talking about is talking about Mark, and I think he references Peter, though I'm not sure about that. But I know he references Mark, who was with Peter. Doesn't say anything bad about anything. It's kind of a little bit of a leap to go to that. So in closing, study the whole Bible. <laughs> Ask someone who knows the language if you do not know the language yourself. I know there's a lot of people who don't know Koine Greek nowadays. I get that. Find someone who does. Write a professor at a college if you have to. Find someone who does. Don't. Don't don't Google it. Don't don't Google it. Because I was googling one thing just out of curiosity as to what some because somebody was like, so can I just Google that? And I was like, I don't know. Let me get back to you. So I Googled it. Jehovah's Witness was the first thing that popped up. I was like, what did they oh. know? What did they know about this? But anyways, um, don't take everything you hear for fact. When you read it in a commentary, research what you read in the commentary. Yeah. When you read it in a scholarly article. Research what you read in the scholarly article. When you hear it from the pulpit, research what you hear. When you hear the President of the United States say it, always check. <laughs> always check. Give you a good example from me. When I did the first lesson for Mormon, remember we did two lessons on Mormonism. I did the first part, he's the second part. Remember that? Now, I said in the first part that Mormons couldn't drink soda. Or, or no, no, I said – no, no. I said that they owned a soda company. Yeah, that's what I said. I said that they owned a soda company. Chuck looked that up, and do you know what he, said? he found? That it was not true. Uh, then he told me that it was not true, and then I told you guys. I am sorry. That was something I did not research, and I just assumed that it was fact because someone from a pulpit said it. See? Uh, so I looked like an idiot because that guy proclaimed it to the entire university when he didn't do the research himself. Uh, see what I mean? See what I'm, see, see what I'm seeing right now here? Right. And, I, and I'm not – you know, I, I, I'm not saying what Chuck did was wrong. I'm saying what he did was right. That's what you guys should do. Uh -huh. When somebody says something, you research it. Don't blindly believe something. Yeah. By all means, that's exactly what the cultist does. <laughs> oh, well, Jehovah's Witnesses say that they're really good at Greek, so I guess I'm just going to believe them. Well, see what I mean? Just, okay, hold on, hold on. Um, so don't take everything you hear for fact and get past your own personal bias on a certain topic. Yeah. Get past what you want the Bible to say and find out what the Bible actually says. This is a summation of everything that we've talked about in the, in the last two years. And so if you don't remember any of the specifics from Hebrews, you don't remember any of the specifics of how to study your Bible, you don't remember any of the specifics about the cults, about apologetics, remember this. Study the whole Bible. Ask someone who knows the language. Don't take everything you hear for fact and get past your own personal bias. Okay?
We are done for the year for let, for teaching. That's the last thing I'll teach you this year. Next year, next week we have our party, and it is the last thing of the year. We have not canceled anything this year. Now it'll just be at your house. Yes. Yes. No. Oh yes. Yes. And I was gonna mention that next week, but I'll mention it now instead. Um, if, yeah, from here on out, it's at my house. Avoid the confusion of trying to figure out. What house it's at? You're not the only one, Zach. Uh, Lauren, a couple weeks ago, was like, "Wait, where am I going?" <laughs> I mean, yeah. Uh, uh, no, see, so. No, I have to backtrack. <laughs> right? Oh, I, I'm where sorry. Where have we been in about a month? <laughs> right. um, before I forget, were there any questions about the lesson or about anything that I talked about over the past two years? I do have one question. Go for it. What caused this preacher to to turn around? That's what I'm saying. He started looking at all these things as irreconcilable, and he just, oh, well. That, that was it. There wasn't like a turning point. He just like slowly faded back. It didn't really clarify. Um, he just said that he was a Methodist pastor, mm -hmm. and that um, you know he got uh, he got tired with all the evidence that he saw against what he believed, and so he just uh, he quit his pastorship, and now he he wrote that okay. book. Was he like a well-known one or just? Um, no, he was just a Methodist pastor. Huh. Why it's important that our leaders know what they're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Well, good question, though. Yeah. Uh, it can happen to anyone. Yeah. A me the Methodist denomination is older than the Assemblies of God. Yeah. It can happen to anyone. Uh, any other questions? Yeah.